Now I'm going to give a rundown of what I see scripture saying should occur for a variety of situations involving people's sexual and marital histories. I mean to keep this presentation a bit lighter for exegesis, although using some of the same scriptures that I've cited before in a different arrangement for this discussion. More pertinent scriptures for doctrine are cited in the earlier presentations that I recommend before this presentation, as those are more foundational. All of my falling conclusions come from rehearsing scriptures that I've cited myself after a long time of study and meditation and prayer to make challenging adjustments to my own thinking. The following are my deductions from all that I studied, all coming from what I have covered. As established in part one, there are two principles that a man and woman must consider for avoiding sin with marriage and divorce, and also for finding the correct resolutions to situations where they might be at a given time after whatever might have occurred in the past. The first question for a given woman is, who is she bound to? If a woman is bound to a man, then any other man having sexual relations with her commits adultery against the man and his marriage in God's sight. And in the case of believers, that holds true regardless of whether one or both consented to the separation. The second question overlaps the first in practicality for many cases, but refers to a different effect, and that is the concept of pornea, is a woman in a pornous state. A woman who is in a pornous state is, is to be avoided by any man as she is in a state of being defiled, fundamentally sexually disloyal, and so a man would defile himself to become one flesh with her. That is the sin that occurs when a man uses a prostitute, or just as much if he marries a woman who is unrepentant of past promiscuity. Just a quick reminder, this is part of why God gave women a hymen or even if he does not make himself rid of his own pornous so-called wife. On this issue, I'm going to arrange a few verses on the subject to address how certain situations should resolve, first revisiting Paul's teaching on pornea in 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not meant for sexual immorality, pornea in Greek, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute, Greek pornis? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute, porny in Greek, is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality, pornean in Greek. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body, but he who commits sexual immorality, pornion, sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now does it say, he who commits pornea cheats on his wife? No. Does it say, he who commits pornea objectifies her or otherwise sins against the prostitute? No. Does it say, he who commits pornea should have married the prostitute before becoming one flesh with her so as to avoid so-called premarital sex. No, and that message especially couldn't be farther away from what the scripture is teaching. Nothing in this teaching says anything about marital states, but then cites the effect of becoming one flesh with the prostitute as being the sin and something absolutely not to be done as a man becoming one flesh with a prostitute commits a sin against his own body. And recall, that's Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. For a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. If an unmarried man uses a prostitute, he's becoming one flesh with a prostitute. 
If a man marries a prostitute, he's becoming one flesh with a prostitute. If a man marries a virgin who then becomes a prostitute and he stays married to her, then he is becoming one flesh with a prostitute. And to remind, this is what Jesus was talking about when he mentioned pornea as an exception for divorce, the same word that Paul's defining here, that a man might need to divorce his wife in obedience in this case. The concept is actually that simple. It's no more and no less than what Paul is saying, and it's a concept hidden in plain sight here insofar as it is far from the way modern Christianity understands sexual sin, again, for lack of a better term. It is well known throughout scripture as I covered in the first video on Jesus' exception clause of Matthew 19, 9, that a man sins to have sexual relations with a promiscuous woman as she is defiled, and therefore the man who becomes one flesh with her sins against his own flesh. This is not exactly the same concept of adultery, although the two sins often occur at the same time. The law in Leviticus 18.20 shows that having sexual relations with another man's wife, in addition to adultery, is also the sin of pornea with the effect of defiling himself with what is now becoming a sexually disloyal woman, just as adulteresses are also often seen likened to prostitutes in scripture in the original Hebrew and Greek all across the Bible. Recall also that pornea is the Greek word for prostitution, and so Greeks often rightly translate it to the figure of speech playing the whore when appropriate, when it's not referring to professional prostitutes. Hebrew does the same thing with its word for prostitute. Leviticus 18.20 do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. For exercising discernment, we must understand both concepts because they actually don't necessarily occur together, however. Going forward into the practical side of what these concepts mean for how to respond to situations, reading two Old Testament laws together extremely carefully can teach us a great deal, also keeping in mind which of these laws was written before the other, with the first beginning in Exodus. Exodus chapter 22, verses 16 and 17. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If the father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. Notice that this woman receives no punishment and is not called a sinner of any kind. So the next law, written later in Deuteronomy 22, chapters 13 through 21, a little bit abbreviated. If a man takes a wife and, after sleeping with her, dislikes her and slanders her and gives her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I did not find proof of her virginity. If, however, this charge is true, and no proof of the young woman's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of the town shall stone her to death. She has done an outrageous thing in Israel by playing the whore, Greek translates this to pornea in the Septuagint, while still in her father's house. You must purge the evil from among you. There is no difference that between these two women except that the latter kept her sexual interaction a secret. Like the first woman, her sexual history very well could have been as little as one time with one man, not to mention that she likewise could have been seduced, as if that were a relevant detail as well with the only difference that can really be known is the fact that she kept her sexual act of secret, only to be caught on the night that a man takes her as his wife. It cannot be overstated how important it is to consider for all its worth. God is the one who designed women and also only women in such a way that would reveal whether she did or did not have sexual relations with a man at some point in her life. This has not changed. And that fact, at the very least, 
cannot be treated as a relic of an older time for an outdated principle. God still designs women this way. Some theologians very foolishly see the punishment that she received as being a result of being promiscuous during betrothal, which is also punished by death as adultery, where there is clearly absolutely no way of knowing when her sexual act occurred or with how many men. It only takes one man at any point in her life for the result for losing her hymen and therefore evidence of virginity. And it could have very well easily happened long before a betrothal, which is more likely anyway, since betrothal is not so long a period of time that would compare to plenty of years in her life before it. In line with that, the law explains her sin plainly as playing the whore while still in her father's house, very obviously not stating her sin as an offense against her betrothed, although it does make her unmarriageable to her betrothed because she is in that porn estate. Another reason why Jesus said using the word pornea rather than adultery is also important. All that can possibly be known is that she slept with at least one man at some completely unknown point in the past and that this was only discovered by what would be her husband when he approached her. Now once again, noting that this law is written in a later book than the previous law in Exodus, we can revisit the older law to notice all the difference imaginable as far as what happens to the virgin in this act of so-called premarital sex, beginning with noticing that, of course, the virgin who was seduced also made her act while still in her father's house. But whereas the woman who was discovered not to be a virgin as she was approached by the man who took her to be his wife was said to have played the whore and then was stoned to death, the seduced virgin in the law of Exodus is not treated like she has committed any sin whatsoever. She is not said to have played the whore. Again, this happened while still in her father's house and she is not punished in the slightest. Now, when contrasting these two women, one labeled a sinner and stoned to death with the other not said to have sinned at all and not punished in the slightest, one must consider that there is also absolutely no way of knowing if the woman said to be guilty of playing the whore was seduced or not, or even if she was raped, so that the first woman was seduced cannot have anything to do with the difference between them either. What is significant about the difference in the events is that the woman who was found guilty then, who very may well have had sexual relations with only one man, also very well may have been seduced, said nothing about what happened, only to be caught at the latest possible time. What this tells us then is that she kept herself silent to purposefully avoid marrying the first man whom she slept with, which is what would have happened if she said anything about it like the seduced virgin in Exodus. And that attitude of purposefully avoiding the normal course of ending up married, married to the man is the reason why she is said to be guilty of playing the whore. Of course, the guilty woman may also likely have had sexual relations with more than one man, but there's no way of knowing, based on the simple fact that she isn't a virgin, but it could have been as few as one. And the very first man she slept with would have become her husband unless the father had forbidden it. The conclusion here is as simple as it is inevitable. Marriage is the obligation when a man and a woman have sexual relations, as we saw, also know from elsewhere, in particular the aforementioned 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 20, that sexual relations is the act of becoming one flesh, provided that the woman is marriageable and not in the condition of a prostitute or a promiscuous woman. That is to say, there are plenty of circumstances in which a woman who is not a biological virgin can still be marriageable, such as widows, or as I covered in the second presentation, if she was deserted by an unbelieving husband 
she is available to another man according to 1 Corinthians 7 verses 8 through 16 or in the case of the woman of Exodus in which the father refused to give his daughter. In all such cases the reasons behind her biological loss of virginity are known but the law that acknowledges women's universally God-given indicator of virginity shows that the woman must consider herself bound to the man whom she sleeps with. And if she does not acknowledge this and try to avoid that outcome, we see that scripture calls such a woman as playing the whore, bound to the first man with whom she had relations, but avoiding that commitment, and unmarriageable to a man afterward, such as the man who finds her not to be a virgin. Furthermore, it's the next man who will first notice the evidence of the loss of her virginity, and it is very much his obligation to respond to the fact as we see in the law. To be absolutely clear from the man's perspective, the sin that can be involved here on the part of the man who notices the unexplained lack of virgin status is the same sin that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20 of Pornia, where Paul describes the sin of becoming one flesh with a prostitute, as this woman who avoided a marriage to a previous man that she slept with is also likened to a prostitute, playing the whore. From the woman's perspective, her repentance must be complete with the acknowledgement that she belongs bound to the first man to whom she lost her virginity, unless her father overrides the resulting marriage with his authority, according to the law of Exodus 22, chapter 16 and 17. On the subject of the father's capacities to block what would otherwise be an obligation of both parties to marry, we can see that the general process behind the legalities of marriage amounts to the transference of authority from the father to the man to whom he decides to give her. Now, some marriages in scripture don't have any real ceremony or legal processes at all, such as between Isaac and Rebekah, but the ceremonies and legal processes of marriage have to do with a man's respect to a woman's father who is her original authority figure. A few Old Testament laws specifically pertain to a father's authority over her daughter and are not at all written between fathers and sons. For example, Numbers 30, starting with verses 3 through 5. When a young woman still living in her father's household makes a vow to the Lord or obligates him herself by a pledge and her father hears about her vow or pledge but says nothing to her, then all her vows and every pledge by which he obligated herself will stand. But if her father forbids her when he hears about it, none of her vows or the pledges by which he obligated herself will stand. The Lord will release her because her father has forbidden her. Now at the beginning of this law, note that we see the phrase still living in her father's house again, just as we do in the law where the woman was said to have played the whore while still in her father's house which is also the location to where she was to be brought when she is stoned, reflecting the fact that her offense was against her father's authority. Again, clearly not as an offense against her betrothed because the timetable of the sin is not known except that it occurred while still in her father's house. This is a phrase emphasizing this first era of her life in which her father is her authority figure, as later in this ch same chapter, after a woman is married, this same law applies with the husband now instead of the father. This is related to a father also permitting her daughter to enter the covenant of marriage. Once again, this can be overridden, even noting that a woman is bound by covenant even in an arranged marriage. All of this to say, the modern world often has an image of a woman willfully and consciously agreeing to marry a man being necessary, but it actually isn't in God's sight as fathers gave their daughters. In other words, for example, a woman cannot be in a marriage arranged by her fathers, but then say she may as well leave her husband and have relations with another man because she never really agreed to the marriage in the first place. Her consciously deciding for the covenant of marriage is not the turning point 
and it's not even necessary that she does so at all since it could very well simply be an act of obedience to her father in the same way the lack of a conscious decision in a woman's mind to marry a man when she sleeps with him is not relevant to how her action is binding to him as marriage such as the seduced virgin who if knowing the law realizing that it's in her best interests to let her father know that she had relations with the man and is therefore as good as bound to him only with the father having a capacity to override her covenant like any other avoiding this means the consequences of the later law in which she would be stoned for playing the whore so now so with that are these conclusions if a couple has so-called premarital sex they must get married plain and simple and, con and should consider the event to be the initiation of them being bound in god's sight as shown directly in the law and reflects the fact that the two became one flesh even if they did not consciously consider themselves committed they repent by acknowledging that they are very much meant to commit from that point onward just as divorce or people's idea when a covenant ends it is completely irrelevant in god's sight as to who is unbound and just as demonstrably considers arranged marriages to be as binding as marriages that began with both the husband and wife consenting the original binding of one flesh obligates the lifelong commitment in god's sight with the only exception being that the woman's father is capable of overriding this covenant at its outset like any other that she makes the repentance of the woman who was caught as well as the man involved does not look like saying we shouldn't have had so-called premarital sex the repentance needs to be we should have gotten married after we did that according to the law of exodus 22 verses 16 and 17 as that's exactly the attitude that is missing from the woman who was stoned for playing the whore while still in her father's house who could have otherwise told her father that she slept with a man while still in her father's house and then the father would decide whether to allow the marriage or override it with his authority over her daughter's covenant and in so doing transfer his authority to the man in what completes the releasing of his daughter to a man in marriage. Now on point with the subject of the father's authority and his transference to the husband, the woman's covenant is complete with the act of sexual intimacy, and then what separately remains is that willing transference of authority from the father to the to man remaining for the marriage to be final. It's a woman's attempt to avoid that marriage with the man she had a relationship with that results in her being called a sinner, being unmarriageable to another man in her state of pornea, as she is said to be playing the whore, and being punished, not the act of so-called premarital sex that simply initiates a marriage without her being called a sinner. Summarizing again, the woman's father can override her vows to God, including the binding covenant implicitly made when whether consciously or not or not to remain one flesh with the first man with whom she had sexual sexual relations after the woman is given from the father to her husband the same authority over the woman passes to the husband which is in the rest of numbers 30. the one flesh act is also the expression of the commitment of marriage and only the woman's father whose authority cannot be circumvented by a man, can override it. Two who have sexual relations must marry according to the marriage law of Exodus 22:16. Now, in a lot of cases of what we sometimes call casual sex, what can be understood as actually happening in terms of God's law can often be a series of broken bonds to unbelievers. What that can mean to be illustrative is that a promiscuous woman repenting can also understand herself to have been abandoned just as much by a series of unbelievers, in which case Paul's message in 1 Corinthians 7.15 would apply 
and she is not bound to anyone since none of her partners ever wanted to stay with her in the first place. However, part of what her repentance of pornia still means is having no lack of willingness to be permanently bound to any of them. And to reinforce that point as another reminder, this is the reason for the man's reaction in the law when he finds his new bride not to be a virgin. The condition of her heart of having had sexual relations with a man while consciously avoiding the normal consequences of becoming married to that man afterward, indicating that she is in that pornous, unmarriageable state and why she is stoned for playing the whore. For a Christian woman's repentance of her past pornea involving unbelievers to be legitimate so as to be restored back to virginity, really meaning her being available and marriageable, her heart condition must not be one and that she would refuse to marry any of her past partners if any of them were willing. Although again, stressing the point, in a casual sex scene, it's more than likely that past unbelieving partners were every bit as uninterested in marriage as she was anyway, in which case she need not consider herself bound to her past partners, provided they were all unbelievers, again, very much likely to be the case. However, it is still crucial that both a repentant woman and a future husband must be honest with themselves, that she possesses no lack of willingness to be married to any of her past partners, but believes them to be unwilling, very much likely the case, and that the new husband perceives her heart to be in this condition as best he can from this perspective, and at that point the sin of pornea is avoided when they marry. He must avoid marrying a woman with the same attitude as the one who was stoned to death for playing the whore, which means she was purposely, purposefully avoiding marrying the first man whom she slept with. To be absolutely clear, without that proper repentance from pornea, it is possible for the man to commit the sin of pornea that Paul describes a man doing as a sin against his flesh in 1 Corinthians 6, 13 through 20, the future marriage, even if the woman is not actually bound to anyone else. That is, adultery might not be committed, but pornea still could be an issue, being the cause of the man's reaction of not finding his new wife to be a virgin. Now, originally, again, in the casual sex scene, both parties aren't interested in commitment, which is a sin on both sides to be sure. If a woman initiated a divorce to an unbeliever in the past, the situation is exactly the same, except there is a great deal more likelihood that the divorced man would have a willingness to rejoin the marriage. I cannot stress enough that part of the twofold issue for a woman's availability to another man in this situation involves being free of a heart of pornea and so rejoining with a willing, unbelieving man will be necessary, if possible, as part of repentance. What's more, recall what 1 Peter 3 says about how a Christian woman ministers to her unbelieving husband within a marriage that she might win him over. And so this could very well be her calling. A new husband to a woman must perceive her heart to be in this state of willingness demonstrated by action, which is to say that rejoining with an unbelieving husband whom she divorced still might not be possible because he could turn out to be unwilling after all, or maybe just impossible to find. Because a new husband must avoid the sin of pornea, joining to a promiscuous woman, as well as adultery. Between believers, however, for anything that separated them, one divorcing the other or a mutual separation, the original marriage must be preserved. That would include a woman leaving and repenting of a second marriage in exactly the same way that she would repent of an extramarital affair that no one decided to call a marriage. The offense is exactly the same and so is the resolution. This was detailed in the first presentation, but the short of it is that Jesus' teaching in involving adultery explained what also could have been inferred by the law of Deuteronomy 24 verses 1 through 4 that a woman who is divorced by her husband 
becomes defiled by her second marriage after a divorce and then afterward remains unmarriageable to her first husband even after the second husband who defiled her with the adulterous marriage divorced her or even died repentance in this case should follow the pattern that we see in hosea chapter 3 in which gomer and hosea dwell together for many days before becoming intimate again, as the woman must be thoroughly repentant of her adulteries. Now notice in the law of Deuteronomy, a second marriage of a woman in which the second husband divorced her or dies, implies that everyone let the marriage run its normal course and no one was repentant, unlike a resolution like in the case of Hosea and Gomer. An adulterous wife can only still be bound to her first living husband which is why her offensive adulteries are ongoing in a second marriage. And as mentioned in part three of this series, that holds true even if the husband took another wife in addition to his first. A pledge to be married is likewise binding because it is a promise for the same event, a word first given by a man and then received by a woman, just as Israel considered betrothal to be binding with adultery laws applying to them with the man and woman then belonging to each other. Another quick reminder about that, that this is why the pledged slave girl cannot be punished as severely as a free one, because the man is not capable of giving this word fully while she has a slave owner and authority over her at the time. These promises are that of the upcoming one flesh event, the consent to do so, regardless of the period between the promise of it and the event of becoming one flesh. The promise is still the beginning of one flesh and so is part of doing so. So adultery refers to the marital unfaithfulness of one spouse to the other while pornea refers to the concept of the corrupted flesh of a promiscuous woman who also then defiles any man who has sexual relations with her. When a man divorces his wife and marries another woman, Adultery against his first wife does occur, but pornea does not. Though a man has committed adultery against his first wife, if he divorced her and married another woman, there is no concept of pornea in that situation that would cause one to be unmarriageable to the other at that point. If a man divorced his wife and married another woman, the new couple is not to separate even though adultery against the first wife occurred in such a situation. Nothing is sinful about this new marriage staying together. No law repulses them from each other. As was covered in the first presentation of the series, the situation that allows or rather actually demands any initiation of divorce is the principle of pornea or a man fleeing a promiscuous woman to avoid defiling himself with her and not adultery or unfaithfulness to the marriage. This is, again, the reason why Jesus' exception clause says that a man should divorce his woman for pornea and not adultery in Matthew 19.9. That Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 6, 13-20 of the abomination of a man sinning against his own flesh when he joins with a prostitute. A man's marriage to an additional woman is the, a new binding covenant that is not to be broken so in that situation in which a man divorced his first wife in favor of another and not from the obligation to rid himself of a whorish woman that is guilty of pornea, he must reunite with his first wife while keeping the first in order to avoid sinning. Other complicated situations can occur that the individual believer should ascertain based on these two principles of adultery and pornea pertaining to whom a woman is bound and to the condition of her heart regarding her spiritual virginity and faithfulness to whom she gives herself. Above all, like anything else, this is a condition of the heart which is then accompanied by action and faith. For some closing comments, I'd exhort the listener to keep a few things in mind for this subject like anything else. In faith, believe that God's way is the best one and the one that will lead you to the best blessings and best health in the end. We do these out of love and faithfulness to God, not that we would get him to owe us something, 
although believing in him, rewarding us in his mercy. His laws and commands are good for us also. Thankfully, his mercy is unlimited as long as we avoid sinning willingly and pursue God joyfully in anticipation of his promises.